everybody, welcome to my channel and if you are new here, I am Mariana and I interview the brightest minds of physical therapy. So if you want to increase your knowledge, start right now by subscribing to this channel, clicking on the bell so you don't miss anything, give us a thumbs up and share with your friends. Today our guest is Dr. Scott Newton and he is a physical therapist with 30 years of experience and is certifying one specialist. And he is going to talk today about wound care. I hope you enjoy the show. Hi, Scott. Welcome to PT Pro Talk. How are you today? I'm doing well. Other than the cold spell we currently have, it's uh, about 19 degrees uh, uh, wind chill in Nashville right now. Cold, very cold. Uh, I'm glad that I'm in Brazil right now. So here it's a little warmer. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So Scott, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, your career, and how did you get to where you are right now? Sure. Uh, again, thank you for having me. Uh, I wear multiple hats, even outside of therapy. I'm a father of three, grandfather of one, a soccer coach, or as in Brazil, football coach, a property investor, and of course, physical therapist. My career started back in 91. I graduated from the University of Tennessee back in uh, 91. In 2005, I went back and got my transitional doctorate. Back in 2004, I became orthopedic clinical specialist, uh, recertified in, I think, 24, I guess every 10 years, 2014, coming back up in a few more years. And then I've been a wound care, certified wound care specialist from an outside organization uh, credentialed since 1999. And I would like to throw a plug in for the APTA there. They have a wound care specialization beginning next year. Uh, so that uh, along with OCS and the others there, uh, anybody that's interested can uh, get certified through the APTA in the future. So I've volunteered in, in various work groups with the APTA, uh, the Tennessee Physical Therapy Association. I've been pretty much uh, in multiple roles from legislative chair to treasurer to president to uh, currently licensing board liaison. I've worked in multiple practices, uh, inpatient, outpatient hospital settings. I've done short stints in home health care and nursing homes. Uh, I was in private practice for just over 20 years and now part of corporate uh, physical therapy and an adjunct teacher at Belmont University there in Nashville as well as East Tennessee State University way up in Johnson, T uh, Johnson City, uh, Tennessee. And I, th at those I teach uh, wound care. And I guess, how did I get to where I am? And I'm gonna kind of recycle that question into where did I, where am I, how did I get here in wound care? Cause I think it's <laughs> more interesting uh, as what we're discussing today. But in the late eighties, uh, I was in my third year of business administration in college when I had a friend of my sister said, hey, I need you to be a physical therapist. Now, late 80s, uh, for those viewers that may be not old enough to remember that, but there was a huge shortage in physical therapy and uh, it was our profession was blossoming and there just was much more need uh, than there was supply. So she introduced me to PT uh, and asked me to come work as a technician. I uh, really knew nothing about it at that time, uh, but my stint as a technician in the summer between my semesters was uh, dealt a lot with cleaning whirlpool tanks. Again, uh, if you're not from the 80s, you probably don't remember the wound, whirl, whirlpool rooms. We had body tanks, we had Hubbard tanks, we had arm tanks, leg tanks, and we would bring patients down uh, from the hospital floors and whirlpool them twice a day. Uh, and then the technicians, we would go up, get the patients, bring them down. We were involved in cleaning the whirlpool, assisting the therapists, and then many times uh, uh, assisting the vascular surgeons who would come down and one particular would talk to the patients and say, you have neuropathy, you can't feel me. Uh, we could run up a bill and take you to surgery and do this procedure, or I can just do it right here. And so uh, I got to sit in with him and watch his procedures of different small amputations and so forth that he did in, in the Whirlpool room and became fascinated with it. So after three years of business administration, I switched to uh, my undergraduate studies into physical therapy and went from there. So that's kind of how I got started with the physical therapy side of it. Wow. I also, uh, well, once I graduated, I, I did, uh, when I was Right before I decided to do the transitional doctorate, actually, I guess before the transitional doctorate 
uh, came about. Uh, I was at a gloom conference and they were showing this lovely machine. It was a near infrared light machine that supposedly reversed peripheral neuropathy. And those commercials are still out there some, some today. Uh, but one of my questions that I thought, this is great. This is the best thing since sliced bread. Where is your research? And they pulled out this article and said that, okay, yes, if you do balance training and you do our machine, you hook up our machine, it improves your balance. And I was like, well, that doesn't tell me anything. Uh, so you, there was no other, nothing control groups, no one just doing balance exercises. So they agreed to give me some machines uh, and do our own research. So I teamed up with the University of Tennessee at Memphis and uh, recruited patients. And we did a study with the near infrared light technology and unfortunately did not come out as they hoped. Uh, it, uh, our control group did not do any better than the treatment group. Um, and so unfortunately, if you look up Medicare and it says uh, anodyne, which was the brand name or any infrared machine, they say they do not reimburse it because of, and then they quote our research. So that didn't go well with the manufacturer, but uh, they're still out there. They're still used. I know uh, in Brazil and some other Central America, as well as Europe, there are some different uh, waveforms that they're playing with to see if it can release nitric oxide and so forth. But at, at, at that time, when the machines we were using, it did not seem to be very effective. And then uh, I guess the other part that got me real going into uh, wound care was after Haiti, the earthquake, you know, there was about 300,000 people killed in a matter of minutes. Well, there was a, many more that were uh, injured. And so I went over after the earthquake and worked out of a tent and we did wound care uh, for those that were still injured. And so that was uh, another rather defining moment into how you can affect someone's life uh, performing wound care. Yeah, that's very interesting. That's a lot of experience in a lot of different areas in private practice and especially the wound care that's what i'm most interested in talking about because i i went to college in brazil and we don't see as much wound care as i believe um, americans do uh, so i'm interested in learning more about that so how does wound care work in an outpatient setting well in a typical outpatient setting uh even if you're doing orthopedics uh, or you're doing sports medicine, you're going to come across wound care. You're going to have that rotator cuff incision that dehisses. You're going to have that ACL, that total knee that's going to have sutures coming backing through. So there, there's really no avoiding it. And that's why I teach the students as well. You may not, you may think uh, gross, stinky, and nasty are the first thoughts that come to your head when you think wound care. But even if you're into sports, you've got to be able to handle some situations without hitting the panic button and calling the physician every time you see a suture backing out. And so I think it, uh, to, to kind of sidetrack there, I think wound care is in all of our, uh, we just don't think about it as much. But when you're focusing in on it, like many of our clinics uh, in this area we do, uh, it has several different components too. First of all is sales and marketing. It's not your typical folks you're working with in your team. Uh, we have endocrinologists, podiatrists, vascular surgeons, plastic surgeons. That's not your typical referral sources or, or your teammates with typical physical therapy. Uh, so we build a good team with those folks and we have a, a back and forth referral relationship. So we may get someone referred to us from a uh, family practice or nurse practitioner. And after the assessment, we come to the conclusion very quickly they need to see a vascular surgeon. So we're the one that's turning around and referring them for that and then back and forth. Uh, and that, that is an interesting part. I think our team, when it comes to our other allied professionals and our other professionals that we work with is a much broader net than when I see the orthopedic side, which usually is just orthopedist, maybe your primary care physician worked in that team. When it gets to wound care, a lot of these patients are diabetics. You're going to have your endocrinologist. You've got to get that glucose under control uh, for them to heal. If they And the diabetic usually has impaired blood flow. So now you've got to get your vascular surgeon in there and work with them. If you end up needing grafting, that may be your plastic surgeon getting involved. So there's a, a lot of components and a lot of teamwork uh, in the wound care side. 
in the outpatient wound care clinic, your typical uh, patients are going to be walking in off the street are venous and diabetic uh, ulcers. Uh, most people, when they think wound care, they think probably what they saw in a hospital when they were doing their internship of large pressure ulcers. In the outpatient setting, we see very little of that. It's mostly the patient is probably in your orthopedic setting every day. You just didn't ask them to take their shoe off and notice that they had this nice little hole on the bottom of their foot. Uh, the American Diabetic Association usually asks at any uh, appointment that you ask the patient to take their shoes and socks off or you see their feet. And in that, they believe that we will reduce a significant amount of amputations if we catch these problems sooner. So uh, this, I would have the viewers keep that in mind. If you're seeing diabetics, regardless of what they're coming to see you for, ask them about their daily foot care, especially if they've already developed neuropathy. Uh, venous ulcers, those uh, patients, especially after knee replacements, hip replacements, if they're having a lot of swelling below the knee, uh, they can develop uh, more venous issues. Uh, and then, uh, D, uh, as I mentioned, DHIS surgical. We see very few cat bites, dog bites, human bites, uh, but those are in there, gunshot wounds occasionally, that type of thing. But the 80% of uh, patients that walk in an outpatient wound care center are venous stasis ulcers. And those are usually contributed by age, uh, obesity, and uh, some other factors. Multiple, if you have more than one child, you're at higher risk. And so uh, we're, as the population is aging, we're gonna see a lot more venous insufficiency problems, a lot more ulcers. And then as where does the therapist kind of plug in there besides just education, as I mentioned, uh, debridement. In many states, the Practice Act limits who can perform debridement. So your physicians generally can, your podiatrists generally can, but in many states, nurses are unable to. So uh, if you think about the physicians, how many surgeons really want to work on a wound? Probably not. And so if, you're, uh, if you as a physical therapist, your Practice Act allows you to do debridement, uh, then that opens an avenue for your treatment. And uh, debridement is one of the primary keys of getting someone to heal. So we use an acronym called DIME, and D uh, is for debridement, I is for uh, inflammation or infection, M is for the wound margins, and E is for the edge of the wound, the edge effect. But D is where we come in with the ability to debride these wounds, to get them cleaner, to get them uh, the biofilm off of them, um, and allow these wounds to heal better. And then as a, a therapist, we're also making that dressing choice. Uh, when we talk about dressings, I won't get too far in the weeds, but just a quick uh, help any person that's changing a Band-Aid, uh, drainage drives decision-making. So if you have a heavily draining wound, you need something like a foam that's gonna absorb a lot of drainage. If you're having uh, minimal drainage, then you could probably get away with a little Band-Aid. And then the second thing to look at is, do you think there's an increased bacterial burden? And so you have uh, all wounds are contaminated with bacteria. Uh, some wounds become colonized, meaning that the bacteria is now replicating and growing. And then some wounds progress to infection, which means they're doing harm to the host and they're multiplying. So if you're concerned about any bacterial burden, then we have things like nanocrystalline silver, which kills over 150 different types of bacteria on contact, as well as MRSA and VRE that we see in the news. It also is antifungal and has an anti-inflammatory property to it. So it's a very interesting product that's been out uh, since uh, about the 90s. And we have things like Cadaxmer iodine, which is a non-toxic form uh, that we can use uh, and to help get rid of bacteria. So the old days of rinsing it every minute with uh, hydrogen peroxide or alcohol or Dakin solution, which is nothing more than household Clorox, household bleach, uh, is, is can be harmful to healthy tissue. Uh, so uh, I'd encourage folks not to use that. Uh, so good hygiene. Um, so in outpatient setting, in our outpatient setting, we also use technicians. So the technician often brings the patient back, removes the old bandage, uh, does good hygiene around the wound, soap, wash, wash it with soap and water if they're going back under compression applying moisturizing cream so they're not going to be itching between visits and then hands it over to the therapist who will assess, make decision to breed or not to breed, uh, 
choose the dressing, choose whether it needs to be offloaded, such in a diabetic or compression wrapped in a venous ulcer. And then uh, oftentimes these patients are seen uh, one to two times a week and they are long haulers. So your average venous ulcer takes about 12 weeks to heal. So from a reimbursement and a business model, uh, you've got uh, a nice business model to go by because these people are going to be around. Unfortunately, diabetic and venous ulcers have a very high reoccurrence rate. So that it's a very good chance in six months or a year or two that patient would be back in to see you. Even with good education, uh, they often have a reoccurring problem. So uh, reimbursement is good. Uh, debridement uh, charges and compression wraps actually with Medicare went up significantly in the past few years where everything else has creeping down or holding, holding still or you know, even possibly getting another 9% cut uh, next year. Uh, so it is a, a nice market uh, if anyone enjoys doing that type of work. Well, that was um, a lot of information. So I'm just curious. So your patients, they get referral specific to wound care or it's they are patients that you notice on your day-to-day -day treatments? The majority of them are referred to us for wound care. So once we're out mm -hmm. there and, and we, well, I've been doing wound care in one particular a spot where my office is for about uh, 30 years. So all the doctors in the area know that if there's somebody walks in with a wound, they just turn around and send them straight out the door to us. And so we build that nice relationship. And we're in more rural areas south of Nashville, and we don't have wound care clinics. Uh, so we are the go-to source uh, for, the, for our primary care nurse practitioners. They usually see them first. And when they go in and say, hey, I've got this, then they turn around and refer them to us for wound care. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, and I don't remember at least seeing a lot of clinics that are specializing in wound care or many physical therapists even. And why do you think that if that's true, if that that's really the case, if there are just like few um, therapies that are specialized or they're just dedicating to see wound care? And if yes, why do you think that usually PTs don't like to work on this area or they are just not common? Uh, when I teach, I usually ask that question of the group and say, you know, after I ask them, what are the first two words that come to your mind when you think about wound care? And it usually has something to do with smelly, stinky, gross. Um, but the next question is I ask them, do they think they will ever do it? And out of the classes of 40, there's usually two or three that are very interested. And so I think there is some folks out there that would enjoy doing it. My daughter included, who just graduated from the University of Tennessee and uh, hopefully will be in PT school this time next year. Uh, she's getting into PT school to do wound care. Oh, she wow. She grew up in, in, in the office with me and uh, has really enjoyed it and has been tossing back and forth between dermatology and wound care. I mean, PT for some time and has chosen physical therapy. So I think there's a small percentage of people that, that do enjoy it. Uh, and I think uh, once they get over the initial, oh, that's not what I thought it was, uh, you get the nice uh, benefit of actually seeing improvement. You can measure improvement objectively from week to week. And we have some nice objective tool, tools with, you know, we can do the Oswestry, we can do a pain scale with someone with low back pain. But with wound care, you get to lay your eyes on the problem and it was this big and now it's this big. And so that is, tends to be gratifying, uh, instant gratification for the therapist. And I think is, is motivation why somebody gets into it and enjoys it. Uh, the other thing I think they would enjoy is oftentimes, especially in the rural area, the physical therapist is the team leader. So as referring to the surgeon, asking the surgeon what are uh, instructing or helping the surgeon to choose which test to perform uh, is, is oftentimes the therapist taking the lead. And I'll throw you a little stat out there. Uh, there was a study done as over five years ago, but they looked at 50 United States medical schools across the country and they received less than five hours of education in wound care through their entire training. So when we get out and say, who is going to take care of these wound patients? 
Uh, most physical therapists have, have quadrupled the education of a MD before they ever get out. And unfortunately, a lot of MDs learn from their internships. And so the information that is being passed down is outdated and unfortunately can be harmful. And so we spend a lot of time being educators, even to our peers. Uh, but that can be enlightening for some therapists if they like to have the lead role uh, in, and wound care can provide that as well. So I've been helping uh, benchmark or upstream rehabilitation, which is uh, what now the second or third largest outpatient provider in the country. And we only have out of the thousand some odd clinics, we only have 16 that actually provide wound care. Uh, and that's 16 more than they had five years ago. So we've grown it from zero to 16. Uh, that it has been a slow process, but uh, yes, you're not seeing it. And I do know that a lot of the wound care clinics used to have uh, physical therapists in them, but they had they are making more of a financial decision and using a lower cost uh, LPN or sometimes RN rather than a PT uh, to do their. And unfortunately, it becomes more of a dressing change. And then the physician is coming in to do uh, oversight. And uh, that's, that's unfortunate. Yeah. And you were talking about education. So I didn't learn anything on PT school in Brazil about wound care. And I just studied to do the board exam in US. So I studied and I saw the theoretical part, but I never like actually saw in action. So I was just curious. And since you are here, I have to ask, could you just like walk really quick, walk us through the steps of the breedman and like, how does it work? Like I never saw it in action. So I was just curious, like what else, what, what everything that you do exactly? Yeah, and there's, there's quite a few different types of debridement. You have sharp debridement, which is what we're, surgical debridement, of course, what a surgeon does. And often, if you ever look at that, it is a bloody mess. If you ever Google it, they tend to go after senescent cells, cells that aren't functioning at 100%. And so they will find the wound and cut up to a half inch outside the border of the wound. So it looks much larger by the time they get through, but they're trying to get all the... Uh, non-functioning cells out of the way. So that's a surgical debridement. That may be done once. Uh, what we generally do in our is a sharp debridement, which can be done oftentimes with a scalpel, uh, sometimes with a curette. Um, forceps can be used and scissors. Uh, in, in high tech areas that can afford it, they also have ultrasonic uh, debridement, which uh, actually sends out a little mist in front of it it hits the debris and then you can actually visibly see the debris start coming off from the, from the micro cavitation. And so that's, uh, but we don't have that expensive piece of tool, but some of the teaching hospitals do, and I'm sure as price comes down, there'll be more out there. Uh, so, and the other question I usually get is, Hey, did we, do we numb these patients before we pull out a scalpel? Uh, that was my next I question. <laughs> I usually pop up a, a nice picture gentleman has uh, from my collection where I've got a forcep going in one side of his toe and coming out the other. And uh, I've deleted his face over the years due to HIPAA and everything, although he allowed it. But he's sitting in the chair smiling because a lot of these patients come in and have neuropathy. They have no idea we're even touching their foot. So there is very little uh, discomfort, if any. Your venous wounds may feel a little bit, but again, the more skilled you get, uh, you can do a lot of debris, but with very little change in pain level. And then we have topical lidocaine. So if we think it's going to be uncomfortable or sometimes just as a placebo effect, we will put the uh, lidocaine cream over it before we begin the debridement. Uh, but these patients, uh, especially out patients, having little to no pain with the debridement. Uh, once you once you get skilled at it, I can't, can't say that's where you start, but once you get skilled <laughs> at it, uh, there is very little uh, pain with the debris. Well, that's good to know. I was I was just wondering, I was like, that must be painful. How the patients like tolerate that? That that doesn't sound nice. So that's very interesting. I just was one more question about this topic is you said that the nurses, they are not supposed to do that. That's more like a PT role and like the doctor's role, is that correct? It's state specific. 
So some mm-hmm. states do allow nurses, but many do not. But again, PTs are allowed in all states? Uh, PTs are allowed to perform debridement in all states. Now, physical therapist assistants can in many states, but not all. But physical therapists can debrid in all states. Okay, that's good to know. I, I didn't have the chance to see one yet, but maybe one day I'll take a look. It's just something very new. So that's why I was just interested in asking these questions and talking about it because I was super curious. So uh, that was very good. Uh, anything else about the wound care before we jump to the final questions? Any other consideration that you think it's important to um. It, even with the with the sports medicine and orthopedic folks, uh, just make sure you're doing good hygiene. Uh, if you're changing uh, a post-op bandage, maybe it dehiss slightly. Make sure that you're washing it really good with soap and water, preferably with a wound cleansing spray. Uh, we're seeing more evidence that surfactant, which is in the wound cleansing spray, and you can generally order them from Walgreens or Walmart, or you can get them off Amazon. Uh, but they are the spray bottle is so that when you squeeze it, it comes out about 15 pounds per square inch of pressure, which is enough to knock some bacteria off without doing harm to the tissue. Um, but the surfactant helps loosen biofilm, and we're seeing the greater role in biofilm and slowing the healing down. Uh, dentists have done work on biofilm for many years. That's the reason when you go have your teeth cleaned, you think they're clean, and then you have them clean, you run your tongue across, and you think, wow, that's, that's really smooth. Most of what they removed and got that smooth feeling smooth was bowel burden, bowel film, which is a colony of multiple different bacteria that are clinging to our teeth. Well, we now know that those same things and those bowel domes are occurring on wounds even as little as three days after the wound opens. So if you're seeing a post-op surgery, their first visit three or four days later in this small opening, they could already be developing a bowel film, which could interfere with their healing. So even in the sports and orthopedics, just make sure you wash the area really good, preferably with a wound cleansing spray. Keep it covered. The old wives tale of letting air get to it is bad, okay? We still have run into that where the even today, ER physicians may tell their patient, keep it covered during the day, let the air get to it at night. Uh, we know that doubles your risk of infection. It slows your healing down and increases your pain level. And that's been known mm-hmm. since 1940. It was published in the 1960s, but here we are today, and we still have, unfortunately, that's that handing down of information rather than looking at the research, and so we still see some of that out there. Uh, So that would be my last bit bit of wisdom is to uh, make sure you're doing good wound hygiene, even with those orthopedic patients. And any tips on, like, when should you refer, refer this patient back to the doctor When's like, when do you think that you can help it or that's something that you should refer? Yeah, so if you are, there is, it's difficult to tell the difference between infection and inflammation when you're looking at a wound. And really what it amounts to is, is it appropriate to the size of the wound? Is the redness appropriate? Meaning if it's an incision, you expect one or two millimeters. Well, if it's two or three centimeters, that's not appropriate size. Is the swelling appropriate for the size of the incision or injury? Uh, Is there odor? Uh, Is there abnormal color uh, to the drainage coming? And so the signs and symptoms of infection and the signs and symptoms of inflammation, if you look at them, are identical. And so how do you tell the difference? And it comes down to uh, a good clinician can diagnose infection visibly better than tests can. And it just amounts to, do, is it appropriate for the wound size? And if it's not, you hit the panic button, you get a hold of the physician, and you get it treated appropriately very quickly. And it may need uh, uh, antibiotics at that point. Just remember, it, most people think uh, a swab culture tells you whether the wound's infected or not. That is inaccurate. A swab culture tells you what bacteria you just picked up and which antibiotic to treat it with. It doesn't tell you if it's infected or not. All wounds are contaminated. All, every time you culture a wound, it should show some bacteria on that swab, but it doesn't mean it's infected because it's not harming the person. Um, so hopefully that's helpful as well. 
Yeah, that's very helpful. I think there is a lot of like common sense and common knowledge that we pass through the years and they're, as you said, not accurate. So that is very helpful. Take, thank you for sharing that. Um, let's go then to our final questions. So what sources of information do you use the most that you would like to share with us? Uh, let's see, what, from a physical therapy perspective, uh, the combined sections meeting, I can't, uh, I don't know, I've been to 20 or 30 of them now, uh, but it is a wide array of, of excellent education and, and hopefully we'll, after COVID, we'll get back to having those in person, uh, but you get all aspects and, and I think for someone starting out uh, the combined sections meeting, you, you'll eventually get uh, what you want to see there and get to see top-notch speakers and information. From uh, a wound care perspective, the, uh, the SAWC conference, it's uh, spring and fall. And again, they have usually people presenting from 10 or 12 different countries uh, and the hottest topics in wound care. And they have three levels. You have a beginner level, intermediate level, and then a researcher level. So you can plug yourself in where is appropriate and it's similar to combined sections and there's multiple tracks occurring at the same time and, and uh, very large 10,000 plus people showing up. Uh, but that's a, an excellent resource if you can get to. And then um, as far as a book, I, I, this the Chronic uh, Wound Care by uh, Diane Kastner is a, a good resource, especially if somebody's asking you to do something that you shouldn't like clean the wound with alcohol every day you have a quick resource to tell the physician here this says that it's harmful and this is why uh, and then from a personal perspective i like the 4dx for um uh, dis the four disciplines of execution from a leadership perspective uh, very helpful in helping you set up goals and achieve those goals awesome and what advice would you give to clinicians that are starting their careers uh, begin with the end in mind, uh, plan ahead, if, uh, especially plan your education. Uh, so, you know, just because someone's out of school doesn't mean you stop learning. That's actually, you just got the basics and you, you should be like a little sponge ready to absorb everything around you. Uh, so, but that needs to be somewhat planned. And if you don't have a plan, then, you know, you're, you're out to, to fail at it. So setting an education plan would be my suggest, suggestion to anybody coming out of school those first few years and uh, then, then following through that plan. Nice. And what qualities or abilities that you think are important to become a successful physical therapist? Be, become a good listener. And, uh, you know, I think there was a study that came out last year with APTA or, or one of the resources that showed that seasoned clinicians spend more time in the subject of the history and less time on the objective in testing, whereas new grads tend to spend very little time in the subject of history and much more time on measuring and trying to get objective measurements. Uh, but the key is, uh, and I'm sure I'm going to butcher this, but, you know, the old line is true is if you listen, the patient will tell you what's wrong with them. Uh, so becoming a good listener is, is key and vital. Yeah, for sure. Um, Scott, if people want to learn more about you, your work, how can they contact you? Uh, through email, it is scott at sn-invest.com. Okay, nice. Scott, thank you so much for sharing all this knowledge and one care. Um, you are my first guest on this area. So I'm, I was very excited to talk about uh, one care with you as I have just little knowledge on the area. So it was super helpful, uh, all your tips and um, everything that you we just talked about. So thank you so much. And I hope our listeners um, just observed a little bit of the information and hopefully they start feeling some desire or some something about wound care. So I think that's just the goal is just spread the information and hopefully you're going to have more PTs on that area. Thank you.